Okay, welcome back to part two of the chapter four lecture based on Kapinski's Healthcare Finance, uh, sixth edition, though this again should apply to most of the recent editions. We've been talking about the balance sheet uh, in the first part of the lecture and specifically the asset side. Now we're going to move into discussing the right side of the, of the balance sheet or the uh, liabilities and owner's equity portion. So uh, what we see here is um, that total, total liabilities and equity adds up to $154 million, which is the same uh, amount that our assets side did. And so this portion of the, um, this portion of the balance sheet represents um, the uh, uh, financial obligations of the organization and the ownership of the organization. This is the capital structure of the organization, how it is financed. Um, and so just kind of quick overview, we have, um, we have our liability section ends here at total liabilities, just above net assets. Um, and so the liability section begins with current liabilities and then long-term liabilities. Uh, that gives us total liabilities, uh, in, and it has the so that has the same structure as our assets. We had current assets and long-term assets total up to total assets, except that here we have two parts to the liabilities and equity portion of the uh, balance sheet. We have the liabilities portion and the equity portion, and this is so Sunnyvale is a uh, this this made up clinic Sunnyvale is a not for profit entity, and so we refer to their equity as net assets. Um, but if this was a a for profit entity, we would refer to it as owner's equity. And I'll kind of toggle back and forth, like I said, between those uh, two words. They essentially mean the same thing um, from from the balance sheet perspective. Okay, so let's talk about the specifics. So a liability uh, represents a claim against the organization um, uh, that is fixed by contract. So liabilities are financial obligations of the business. And if you don't meet those uh, uh, obligations, uh, you can be taken to court by the creditors. Uh, and they can force you into bankruptcy and potentially close your organization uh, in order to sell off the assets uh, of the organization. Um, at a minimum, they can, um, you know, take ownership of the organization and um, and hire new management and you know run the business uh, themselves uh, if they so desire. Um, but uh, failure to pay. Um, uh, your liabilities uh, is a bad thing uh, at the end of the day. So um, some liability obligations, uh, the, who, who uh, holds these obligations from the organization, you know, who is uh, a, a holder, it is, there's a pretty wide range. They include suppliers, vendors, um, employees, um, uh, you may owe taxes, uh, and even not-for-profits pay some taxes, you know, so we pay, they don't pay income tax or property tax, but they do pay um, uh, payroll tax, for example. Uh, so, so there are, uh, you know, there are those liabilities. Um, the largest obligations are to creditors who furnish debt capital to the businesses. So those are uh, bondholders and lend and, and and you know lenders such as banks that are uh, maybe mortgaging uh, purchases of, of of large large purchases of property. So I mentioned uh, you know in the quick overview that we have current liabilities and long term liabilities. Um, Long, uh, current liabilities are always identified as such. Long-term liabilities, you may not see a, a specific line for it, but there's kind of a, a useful way to think about it. And um, again, the definition between current and long-term uh, is the same as it was for current and long-term assets. And that is the dividing point is is an expectation of rather than using it or converting it into cash within a year, which was the definition we used for um, at current assets, 
current liabilities are going to be, we expect to have to pay those, uh, pay those obligations within a year. So some of the most common uh, current liabilities are notes payable, accounts payable, and accrued expenses. Let's talk about uh, each of those. Uh, notes payable are short-term debt obligations, uh, uh, typically bank loans. Um, so uh, uh, they often have a maturity of less than a year. Um, they often take the line, form of a line of credit. Um, and they're usually used to finance temporary uh, increases in, in, in current assets. So uh, if you have some sort of seasonal cyclical kind of thing, so let maybe you're a, um, a hospital that operates on Cape Cod and you have a huge influx of, um, you know, of, of users over the summer and then, um, and then you, it dies back uh, during the course, during the winter when everybody goes goes home and uh, only the, the hardcore locals are left. Um, and then your, your level of um, utilization drops off dramatically. You may need financing, uh, short-term financing to kind of help you through the, the long-term cycle, excuse me, not the, the summer cycle. And then, um, you know, and then pay off those loans at the end of the summer, uh, you know, in the fall when everybody starts to leave. Um, and then you know go back to normal operations, um, but the key here is notes payable typically refer to short-term debt obligations. If they're if they and they're typically uh, less than a year, so it might be you get a ninety-day loan. Um, you can have notes payable that run longer than that, so they could be multi-year notes payable. In which case, you're going to see. Um, uh, current portion of notes payable listed in the current assets and long-term portion of notes payable listed in the long-term portion of, sorry, not assets, but, but liabilities. So you'll have, again, the um, current portion of notes payable will be listed in the current liabilities and a long-term portion of the notes payable will be listed in the uh, long-term assets if the notes run longer than a year. So if let's say you've got a three-year note, you'd have, uh, uh, the portion that's due, the, the portion of the principal that is due uh, in the first year um, uh, would be listed in the current liabilities. So let's say you took out a uh, $30,000 note and a th on three years and you're, and you're going to pay $10,000 back each year. The current portion of the notes payable would be $10,000 because that's the portion of the principal you're going to pay back this year. And then the long-term portion of the notes payable would be the $20,000 balance. Okay. Um, but other short-term debt would be carried in the current liabilities if it's due um, or expected to be paid back in under a year. Accounts payable is another kind of credit. Um, but this is typically not a formal, uh, formal the way that, say, a bank loan is. Instead, this is typically, this is common. Um, you know, you'll see um, uh, vendors sell you, um, sell organizations. You'll have a relationship with a vendor and um, you go to buy a box of supplies. Let's say you, you place an order for $10,000 worth of supplies. Um, and the vendor ships it to you. And uh, upon receipt, you have uh, terms of payment, uh, say net 30. And what that means is you have to pay the $10,000 within 30 days. Um, once you've signed for the, uh, once you've signed for the, for the box of supplies, um, that $10,000 of supplies or that $10,000 bill is a payable for you much the same way that an account receivable is a payable due to you. This an account payable is one that you owe to somebody else. So they're kind of, uh, 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 well, they're, they're on opposite sides of the, uh, of the balance sheet, one due to you, one you owe to somebody else. Um, this is referred to as trade credit. Um, so it's not bank credit. Um, but, uh, but in a sense, 
um, your vendors when they offer you terms of, you know, hey, we'll let you pay this within, uh, you know, we want you to just pay this within 30 days. Um, essentially, they're making you a 30 day loan of, or up to a 30 day loan of $10,000, right? So it, that's why it's called credit. If you think about it, they're making a loan to you of, for, of $10,000 for 30 days. Um, and a later chapter in the text gets into, um, you know, how to value that and so forth. Now, a lot of times um, you'll see um, uh, um, credit terms where there is a discount offered. So in that case, the terms might look something like two slash 10 net 30. And what that two slash 10 means is, if you pay us within 10 days, we'll give you a 2% discount on the purchase price. Um, otherwise, the net is due in 30 days. So vendors will offer that kind of arrangement to try to encourage you to pay, uh, pay them sooner. Um, so essentially, you're getting a, you know, you're getting a 2% discount on um, a $10,000 purchase. That's, you know, you're buying uh, $10,000 worth of stuff for $9,800 instead of, or, or uh, 9,000, <laughs> uh, 2% off 10,000. Yeah, 9,800. I, I, I always doubt myself when I do that kind of, so you get a $200 discount, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you multiply that out over the course of a year, uh, it actually turns into a fi fairly significant um, uh, way of financing the remaining uh, 20 days. So again, an example would be 10 to net 30 or, um, you know, five, one net 30 or something like that. Um, and it's simply the first portion represents, uh, the discount that the, that the vendor is offering you if you pay in a more timely manner. And then the net 30 means, um, you know, it, it's the, the full amount is due in 30 days. If you hold, you know, you can, you can, use our um, trade credit for up to 30 days. Uh, but at that point, you owe us the full amount. Um, so how much trade, cr trade credit should be used and why? Uh, there's a whole chapter on this, on that in the textbook. Um, but you should take advantage of the trade credit. Uh, uh, again, the trade credit is, is a free way of financing. So there's, there's actually, a, like I said, a whole chapter on here in, in the text about that. But, um, you know, there's some risk in taking out longer, uh, larger amounts of short-term debt, right? It, it, it increases your, um, or decreases your current ratio. Um, you have to pay these things very quickly. Um, and then there's an issue of if the, if the organization, if the vendor is offering you uh, a discount, then it becomes very expensive. So uh, lots of, uh, if you're curious about this, like I said, I think it's chapter 16. There's a whole chapter about making those sorts of decisions. All right. Um, but accounts payable is, you know, definitely going to be one of the most common uh, categories of current liabilities. Next is going to be accrued expenses or often referred to as just simply accruals. And they're, they're very similar to uh, accounts payable and that they are, uh, the way I think of them is they are um, uh, accrued over time uh, as opposed to having um, an explicit and well-defined uh, kind of parameter around them. So what I mean by that is uh, uh, an accounts payable is typically tied directly to a very specific uh, transaction. So I order a $10,000 worth of supplies. Uh, I get the box. I have a account payable for $10,000. Salaries, on the other hand, kind of flow over time. So if I have, um, if I have uh, an employee that earns, um, say, $500 a week, I'm accruing $100 each day that employee shows up to work. At the end of a two-week pay period, let's assume they're on a two-week pay period, I owe them uh, $1,000, right? $100 a day for 10 days. At the midpoint of, uh, of the pay period, so after the first week, I have accrued an obligation to my employee of $500. 
after Monday of the next week, I've accrued an obligation of $600. After Tuesday, I've accrued an obligation of $700 and so forth until I get to Friday, at which point I've accrued the full $1,000. So um, this becomes important because remember, we talked about the balance sheet as a snapshot in time. And so if I, if, if let's say um, my, cal- uh, my organization runs on a calendar year and the midpoint, um, the pay period uh, for my employees has one week in December of uh, the last week of December and the first week of January of the following uh, calendar year, my employee, my $100 a day employee would have accrued $500 worth of salary in say 2019 and, and then would continue to accrue another $500 in um, the first week of 2020. If, but because it's a snapshot in time and I'm going to close out and, and take the snapshot uh, on December 31st, I will have an accrued $500 of salaries uh, that is due to my employee on December 31st. Uh, even and, and I will, so I have this obligation that I have accrued as of the end, as of December 31st. So that's what I will count there. Other examples I like to think of here would be um, things like. Um, uh, uh, utilities make a, a, a good one. You know, taxes accrue over time. Uh, interest payments accrue over time. So if you're, again, it, the accrual is really the result of the fact that the balance sheet is a snapshot in time and it cuts off. It doesn't necessarily cut off, say, at the end of a pay period or at the point at which you actually uh, uh, calculate the amount of taxes due to the government or, or the, the point at which your your payment to your um, to the government is due, so forth. So that's why these things accrue. And again, the, the difference between accruals and accounts payable is kind of a little nebulous, but it is, you know, to the, I think the most useful way to think about it is, um, again, an accounts payable has a clear kind of well-defined transaction associated with it, whereas an accrual is something that is accumulating over time. And so each day uh, you accumulate more of an obligation. Okay, so that's that makes up, uh, those sections make up the current portion, or the current liabilities. Now we're going to shift to the long-term portion of liabilities and the most common one is uh, long-term debt. Um, uh, and um, uh, long-term debt represents uh, uh, an obligation that is going to, t- to go for more than one year. So kind of on the consumer side, if you've purchased a house, most likely you've purchased it using a 30 year uh, uh, mortgage, right? And so businesses can do the same thing. They can get multi-year financing, five, 10, 20, 30 year financing. Um, typically small businesses, when they go out to get their long-term debt, they work with uh, commercial banks. A commercial bank simply means a bank that works with um, with commercial entities, so with businesses. Um, so uh, uh, a lot of a lot of local banks will have a commercial operation and a retail operation. The retail operation is is you know meant for us as individual consumers, and the commercial side of the bank is is working with businesses and providing financing to businesses. Um, so. Uh, uh, small businesses typically will work with commercial banks. Uh, they'll get you know, called term loans. Um, larger businesses typically um, also have uh, com- uh, relationships with commercial bankers, and they'll use a mix of, um, of financing from commercial banks. But if you're a large enough business, so a community hospital is typically large enough, uh, you may also be able to issue bonds which are basically loans that you sell to the marketplace. So instead of, instead of um, borrowing from a bank and a specific banker, instead you work with an investment bank, which is different from a commercial bank. Um, and an investment banker helps organize the sale of bonds. So private, private investors or um, 
well, investors, not necessarily just private investors, but investors um, purchase uh, bonds from your organization and that, and, and then those bonds become obligations to those investors and you pay the investors directly. Um, that's a complicated concept. And again, there's a whole other chapter on bonds uh, later in the textbook that we'll get to later. Um, but either way, this information is noted in the financial statements. And then typically there are, you know, so there's kind of like a summary line uh, in on the balance sheet. And then I talked before about, you know, having notes uh, on the balance sheet. Those notes uh, would, would explain, you know, the different uh, ways that the long-term debt is, is organized. Okay, so that basically concludes the liabilities portion of the liabilities and owner's equity side of the um, balance sheet. So we have the two parts have to add up together. So the liabilities and the equity have to add up to the uh, total assets, right? So we're uh, showing our identity here at the bottom of the screen. Equity equals total assets minus total liabilities, which is just simply rearranged to, from total assets equals uh, equity plus total liabilities. Um, and that's kind of uh, why we use the phrase net assets um, for not-for-profits is we have our total assets. So, you know, let's imagine a uh, community hospital. Its total assets is, you know, its building and all the property inside the building, um, the uh, uh, accounts receivable, uh, all the cash they have in the bank. So that's all their assets, right? And then they have, maybe they've issued bonds and maybe they have some other loans and they owe their employees. They've got some accrued salaries to their employees and so forth. And that's all their liabilities. So the net um, of the assets, so the assets minus the total liabilities, nets out to net assets. Um, and this is, I find this phrasing awkward because a lot of people, a lot of my students want to take um, when I tell them, hey, you've got this much net assets, they want to they want to treat it treat net assets as if they're assets instead of simply a statement of the owner's equity. So remember that net assets are not assets; they're actually simply a statement of how much, um, what portion of the of the uh, assets are owned outright by the organization. So equity, you know, more generally, equity is um, the non-liability claims against a business's assets. So for an investor-owned business, that's the amount, uh, the equity is the amount of owner-supplied financing, uh, as well as um, kind of the, you know, the, the, well, it's the amount of owner-supplied financing, um, whether that's in the form of or original contributions by the owners to the business in the form of common stock, or if it is, the amount of money, the amount of profit that the owners have left in the business instead of pulling out as dividends. Um, for a not-for-profit business, the equity account is the amount of capital supplied by the community. And, you know, so this may have been in the form of donations at the beginning, you know, so when the hospital's first being founded, it could be um, the result of, you know, large gifts from wealthy members of the community. Um, and then it, and then added to that is any profit that the hospital earns year after year is all retained. Remember, we talked about that. Um, uh, Not-for-profit entities have a non-distribution constraint, which means they can't distribute any of their profits um, because uh, to shareholders because there are no shareholders. Right? So, so um, the sources of capital for a not-for-profit business are donations from the community. Um, as well as earnings, uh, profits that the that the not-for-profit business earns over time that they then retain. Um, so the equity. So I, I've said a couple of times that the overlap between um, the way that a financial statement looks for a for-profit and not-for-profit is like ninety-five percent the same this is one area where things look different. Um, so we're going to look at um, uh, the way a uh, not-for-profit 
uh, uh, accounts for its equity as well as um, the way that a for-profit accounts for its equity. Um, and then I have a actual, I have that same hospital's actual example of their uh, liabilities and net assets statement, and you'll be able to see, um, uh, you'll be able to see how they list their net assets. So from a for-profit equity section, a very, very simple one, because there are actually other other categories of stock and other other ways to other things to document, but a a very simple for profit uh, uh, entity would have two broad categories of um, of equity. Uh, the first is common stock, and that represents the amount of of uh, money contributed by investors. Uh, to to the organization. So this is this is money um, contributed, so given by the investors to the organization. So if this was, let's say, this is um, a imaging center started by three radiologists. If each of them contributed three million dollars, um, they would have nine million dollars in common stock. Right, so that's three times three is nine. So $9 million in common stock. So that would sit there um, and it doesn't change unless the investors um, add more, you know, contribute more money to the business. Um, and then as the business, so once they start the business with that $9 million investment, then they start running the business. And at the end of each year, if they've had profit and they've decided to retain some of that profit in the business and not pay it out, uh, as as dividends to that themselves as investors, then that accumulates as retained earnings. So each year, as you can see, retained earnings in hopefully increases. Um, so from 2014 to 2015, they uh, this business retained roughly eight million dollars of its profit. And so total equity is the sum of the common stock and the retained earnings. So common, so the total equity increased from 46 to 54 as a result of the increase in retained earnings. Okay. Um, the retained earnings uh, account uh, or the entire net equity account for a not-for-profit is affected by the amount of net income shown on the income statement. Um, for a not-for-profit business, all of that money flows over from the, you know, all of the profit is retained and becomes retained earnings. For profits, you can, you can um, potentially pay out some portion of that profit. And we did that when we looked at that last time in chapter three. So, um, so you start with your net income or net profit for the year. And then if you are a for profit, excuse me, a, a not for profit, all of that net income flows in um, to the to the equity account, increasing the the net assets. If you are a for profit, um, the owners have the right to decide how much of the profits are going to be retained by the business and how much are going to be paid out to the uh, shareholders or owners. Um, and so the re remainder that is left to the business is called retained earnings. Okay, so um, the right side of the balance sheet shows the mix of debt and equity financing. And so when you hear the phrase capital structure, what, you're sim what, what we're simply talking about is how much debt and how much equity uh, does an organization have. Um, so uh, uh, how much debt you carry has an impact on the overall um, risk of the business. And... I like to draw the the um, uh, reference to uh, uh, to the movie Goodfellas and Joe Pesci. And there's a part of the movie where a uh, restaurant owner is having trouble meeting his bills, and so he takes out a uh, he's he takes out a loan from Joe Pesci, who's playing a, gangst, a gangster. And um, uh, uh, the problem for the restaurant owners, he's still in still having cash flow issues. He's having and, and but once he he can't pay 
uh, Joe Pesci, uh, Joe Pesci just starts coming in and taking stuff out of the restaurant. Um, uh, and then ultimately burns the restaurant down. It's a great, um, it's a great little segment on, um, on capital structure. So if you get a chance to YouTube that, um, it, there's some colorful language uh, in, in the scenes. Um, but, uh, but I think it illustrates it well. It illustrates the idea of risk, right? So the more debt you take out, the more financial risk you have. And the reason you have that, that the reason that's financial risk is if you take out a loan, your, the bank expects you to pay the loan, you know, on a monthly basis. They expect you to pay the interest or potentially if it's a mortgage, the interest and principal portions at the end of each month. And if you fail to do so, uh, you're in default and the bank can uh, take you to court and can put, potentially push you and force you into bankruptcy uh, and then start taking your assets just like Joe Pesci did, though they probably won't burn, you, burn your, you know, your building down. Um, uh, so there are different measures of, of financial risk. Um, but basically the more debt you carry, the more fixed liabilities you have, you know, the more fixed payments you have every, you know, every month or every quarter or whatever the payment arrangement is. And then on top of that, the more you have, uh, more debt financing you have, um, the more you have to pay out in interest. Now there's some you know, some things to think about. And again, this is a topic for a later discussion, but um, investors are taking a lot of risk on a business. So the, you could think like, oh, you know, with equity financing, I don't have to pay fixed payments, but equity investors expect some sort of return on their investment. Um, they're, uh, you know, as opposed to, this is not a donation, right? These are four, this is when we're talking about a for-profit company, talking about equity investors. Um, a for-profit equity investor expects a return on their investment. And so um, they expect to either earn dividends or be able to sell their shares of the stock for a higher amount. So there is an implied um, interest rate on the uh, on equity financing, even though there's no you know month to month payment that is required. All right, so um, Sunnyvale's balance sheet reported about fifty four million in equity. Uh, uh, one of the physicians has proposed that the equity be tapped or used to build a new clinic on the north side of town. Is the fifty four million available for this purpose? And the answer is no. Um, it's again the right side of the balance sheet is is just a claim a claims on the assets of the organization. Um, you know you can't tap into the equity in that sense. Uh, you could refinance the organization potentially uh, and take out uh, and take out additional loans, which would then shift um, uh, make changes to the balance sheet. But the answer here is as simply as is no. It's not available equity is not an account, um, uh, you know, where, where money is sitting. Okay. Um, so we've kind of talked about the equity side. Uh, sorry, we've talked about the equity side for, for for-profit entities. Now let's talk about uh, the equity side for not-for-profit entities. So for not-for-profits, um, the way that not-for-profits get uh, equity funding is different than the way that not-for-profit, excuse me, for-profits get uh, funding. Um, not-for-profit, you know, for-profits have investors and those investors contribute money to the organization uh, in exchange for an ownership stake in the organization. Um, however, you know, not-for-profits don't have owners, so, but they do get contributions from, uh, from the community. Uh, very often, that's how you know a not-for-profit gets started. Is somebody, somebody, or some buddies uh, make a uh, a large contribution to get the organization started. Uh, when you make contributions to the organization, um, they can be of three general types, and so they're and then so those contributions are then categorized uh, as three different types. The first type is an unrestricted contribution. And so what an unrestricted contribution is, is when a, um, uh, when a donor writes a check, gives it to the, uh, gives it to the not-for-profit organization and says, I believe in you. Here's, you know, my check for a million dollars and, uh, use it wisely. Uh, and I trust you. 
right? So unrestricted. So in that case, the organization's management then can do whatever they think is best uh, with the uh, within you know within the law, whatever they think is best with that money. Um, so that's an unrestricted uh, uh, asset. Um, an unrestricted net asset. It becomes an unrestricted net asset. That million dollars is entered as cash. And then, uh, so we have these, the, the two sided um, entries. So one, so, so uh, the double entry would be an increase in cash of $1 million and an increase in unrestricted net assets of $1 million. Uh, and notice Cash is an asset. It's on the asset side of the balance sheet. So it went up by a million dollars. And um, and when that when one side of the balance sheet increases, the other side of the balance sheet also has to increase. And so the uh, net assets is on the right side of the balance sheet. And so it also increased by a million dollars, keeping our little, um, you know, uh, the metaphor of the scales in balance, right? So we had on the left side, we increased by a million. On the right side, we increased by a million. So that's one example, an unrestricted um, uh, donation comes in as cash and, and a, a current asset, and then uh, an unrestricted net asset, which is you know on the net asset or the equity side. A temporarily restricted um, uh, uh, donation is one where there are some sort of conditions uh, which when met, uh, the asset, the donation then becomes unrestricted. So uh, this, an example of this would be, you know, uh, me with my many, many millions of dollars that I've earned uh, uh, in, in government service, you know, when I die, I donate, uh, you know, a million dollars to uh, the hospital uh, that I, you know, that uh, of my choice, but I say, um, you can only use this million dollars um, uh, uh, for um, educational purposes. Um, and so that's a temporary restriction. There's a condition on it. And when that condition is met, the organization can uh, use that money for the purpose that I, uh, that I told them to, to use. Um, and so... Uh, so at the point at which the hospital is ready to say maybe build a simulation center or something like that, it taps into the the donation that I made, and that it, that donation then is released from uh, temporary restriction, and the organization can use that money. Again, still a million dollars cash comes in, um, so that goes to the left side of the balance sheet, and then. On the right side of the balance sheet, a million dollars in temporarily restricted net assets increases. Now that cash would probably uh, would probably be accounted for on the left side of the balance sheet as a um, a temporarily restricted uh, portion of the current uh, uh, current liabilities. And then the last category is permanently restricted. So this is a donation that you know is made to the organization, and they can never. Um, uh, use it for anything. Uh, the purpose to, you know, to create, say, an endowment. Um, so, for example, I might give you the million dollars and say, this is permanently restricted, a permanently restricted gift. But usually the parameter there is um, you can use the interest off of this gift, right? So whatever, you know, so you have to keep this million dollars in perpetuity. But, um, uh, but if you invest it in, um, uh, government bonds yielding 5% a year. Um, you can use the, um, uh, what would that be, $50,000 a year that it generates at 5% a year uh, for whatever you want, and that would become unrestricted. The other way that we get, uh, so that's donations, right? Con contributions of capital to the organization. They can come in in one of these three categories, an unrestricted gift, a temporarily restricted gift is basically like a gift with strings attached um, or a permanently restricted gift. The other way that uh, net assets increases is the same way that um, for profits increase, which is if the hospital is in op or the nonprofit entity is in operation and it's earning profits at the end of the year, those profits um, are retained by the organization and they become automatically become 
unrestricted net assets. So unrestricted net assets can increase in two ways. One way is by an unrestricted donation from a donor, and the other is uh, by the entity earning profit over time. Okay. So uh, to close out this portion of the, of the lecture, um, we now are looking at the same hospital as before. Earlier, we looked at the left side uh, or the asset side of the uh, balance sheet. Now we're looking at the liabilities and net assets or liabilities and equity portion of, the, um, of this hospital's uh, balance sheet. And so remember, we said that the, so the first half of um, the liabilities is, uh, uh, is current liabilities. Um, and that consists of the accounts payable and accruals, right? So accounts payable, that's all our, you know, our purchases from our suppliers. And then the accrued accruals, they specifically have here um, uh, accrued uh, salaries uh, due to third party payers. So this is um, another payment that they have. Um, current portion of long-term debt. Remember I talked about if you've got long-term debt that extends beyond uh, or you have debt that extends beyond one year, um, a portion of it is going to show up as current. So that's the portion of the, that is specifically the principal that's due back on, on your debt. So um, if you had a loan, of a $30,000 loan, and you had to pay $10,000 of it this year, plus interest, um, the $10,000 would be here. So the current portion of all their loans is $2.2 million. Um, so they have a total of, of 35 million in current liabilities. And then they have some other liabilities and those are accrued pension and other liabilities. So these are long-term liabilities. So they, they still have some pension, you know, classic pensions. Um, they have long-term debt and note it's less the current portion. So their total long-term debt is the 55, almost 56 million plus the current portion of 2.2 million. So they really have uh you know, more like 58 million in, in long-term debt, but a portion of it is due this year and this is the rest. And then they have some, um, uh, uh, they they, they have a reserve in place for professional liability claims. Uh, so if someone sues the organization, um, and then this is their equity portion. So we have the three types of equity that we talked about, unrestricted, temporarily restricted, and permanently restricted. So permanently restricted is gifts that they can never spend, but that becomes a corpus that they can usually, typically you can use the uh, interest from it uh, in an unrestricted manner. The temporarily restricted, which are gifts um, uh, with kind of strings attached, specific instructions as to when the gift becomes available. Uh, and then the unrestricted, which is a combination of unrestricted donations. So somebody just, you know, donates money to this hospital uh, and says, do with it what you think is best. Or um, it is earnings profits over time. And so this, this organization has been around for a long time. So it's accumulated a lot of unrestricted uh, uh, net assets through the process of retaining its earnings. And so we add all this up and it comes up to 363, which if you remember from the first part of the lecture uh, was the total uh, 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 value of their, of their assets. So this is the sum of their liabilities and net assets. And remember, net assets is just the nonprofit way of saying equity. All right, and we'll move on to the next portion.